reading mise-en-scene in film style from classical hollywood to new media art by adrian martin chapter one Chapter one, a term that means everything and nothing very specific. When it comes to the hollowed foundational terms that shape the field of film studies, words like montage or cinephilia or auteur or genre, words that have launched a million books and articles, I have come to believe it is wise to take heed of the warning of Paul Willman. 1944 through 19 or 1944 through 2012 a voice in the as voice in the 1990s willem or willman 1994 page 226 for him such cherished words have rarely defined anything precise in cinema rather they mark a confusion a fumbling attempt to pinpoint some murky confluence of wildly diverse factors we need such terms he agreed but we should not believe or trust in them too fervently. Rather, they present a smokescreen or, in the psychoanalytic terms used by Willman, a, quote, neurotic knot, end quote, or displacement. For some commentators, tantalizing as a mystery that can prompt further work into their meaning and origin, or for those who obediently trot them out as, rot, er, er, as root learning, simply asphyxiating. Has anyone ever involved in teaching film not experienced at some time or another that horrible crunching sensation when once a strict definition of something has been uttered in the classroom, no matter how provisionally, no matter how quickly freighted with numerous qualifications, you know that all the same, you have just helped to further perpetuate that smoke screen of Oh, certainty? Question mark. Willman, as it happens, was not too fond of the concept or buzzword of mise en scene either. When he did refer to it, which was not often, it was prefixed with a withering quote, so called end quote, implying that it was either a bad term for that or for the specific thing in cinema it was trying to describe, or that what it was trying to describe was a much vaster phenomenon than anything continence by the term. More recently, Jacques Rancier has respectfully but categorically defined the concept of mise-en-scene as a, quote, coarse phenomenology, end quote, speaking primarily of cinephilia and cinephiles, the mad love and lovers of the filmic medium. Rancier declares, block quote, Cinephilia asserted that cinema's greatness did not lie in the metaphysical loftiness of its subject matter, nor in the visibility of its plastic effects, but in the imperceptible difference in the way it puts traditional stories and emotions into images. Cinephiles named this difference mise-en-scene without really knowing what it meant. Cinephilia explains its loves only by relying on a rather coarse phenomenology of mise-en-scene as the establishment of a, quote, relation with the world. End quote. Rentier, 2012, end of block quote. The, the accusations of Willman and Rentier, ardent cinephiles both, let it be said, have more than a little truth to them. But mise en scène, it seems to me, is worth preserving with, not least because it already constitutes a historic object, a body of, explan of exploratory thought into cinema that can be productively revisited today. Even better, as I hope to show, it can still be used to animate much-needed explorations into cinema's materiality. So, what is mise-en-scene exactly, or inexactly, question mark? An attempt to arrive at a workable definition needs to be, or needs to go down several different discursive paths. A clever film critic. It is sometimes useful to start an investigation into the meaning of a word or term by heading right out into the big, wide, vulgar world. Far from the academic cloisters where we debate fine distinctions and micro-histories, mise-en-scene is not as well known or popularized a term as auteur or genre or even montage. Nonetheless, it gets around. 
In the early 1990s, I conducted an informal survey of occurrences of the term in mainstream media reporting of film, television, and show business. Many media journalists, after all, harbor a, silver, harbor a sliver of academic film studies training in their dark past. And if so, they like to both boast about it and disown it in the same dazzling maneuver. Matt Gronig, or Groning, brilliant creator of The Simpsons, penned a comic strip in 1985 titled, quote, How to Be a Clever Film Critic, end quote, as part of his Life in Hell series, 1977 through 2012. It contains a challenge, quote, for advanced clever film critics only, exclamation point, end quote, which is, quote, can you use mise-en-scene in a review that anyone will finish reading, question mark, end quote. The American celebrity gossip magazine Spy mounted an expose of the wicked ways of Jerry Lewis, whose, quote, sloppy, uneven filmmaking, end quote, were authoritatively told, or we are authoritatively told, was confused by silly French critics with, Godard, with Godardian anti-formalism, end quote. Strong stuff for spy readers. Hunted, hunted down those few special individuals, including Harry Shearer from The Simpsons, who had seen Lewis's unreleased The Day the Clown Cried from the early 1970s and drawly inquired, quote, the mise-en-scene was problematic, question mark, end quote, handy, 1992, page 45. Spy long ago went the way of the dinosaur, but another glossy American showbiz magazine, Premier, is still with us today, mainly in online form. A typical opinion piece from the from those years began, quote, film theorists endlessly debate the influence of Renoir-esque mise-en-scene versus Eisensteinian montage. We say, get a life, exclamation point, end quote. Gelman, Waxner, 1991, page 61. To those merry journalists and entertainers, mise-en-scene is pretentious, is a pretentious term, concerned with something at best secondary, but largely inessential to the filmmaking process. It would seem to draw out the spirit of these parodies that style, which in the broadest sense means the ways in which the narrative material of a film is treated, shaped, and delivered to the viewer, is an afterthought in cinema for the de delectation of only the most esoteric specialists. I can still hear ringing in my ears from two decades ago the voice of a newspaper sub-editor who answered my query about why he had cut my finely wrought paragraph on the camera angles of Jane Campion with the immortal words, quote, camera angles, question mark, who gives a damn about camera angles, question mark, end quote. Indeed, comments such as these take us directly back to the era when critics first felt compelled to coin or appropriate and fight for the term mise-en-scene. Within the popular media, the mise-en-scene pendulum can also swing to the other extreme. Staying within my early 1990s survey, I recall hearing the Australian reviewer Peter Castaldi reporting for radio on the Cannes Film Festival screening of Baz Luhrmann's Strictly Ballroom 1992, making the following claim, quote, it has what the French call mise-en-scene, which is direction with a special touch, end quote. This effectively flips the popular assumption that mise-en-scene is essentially about ornament, ornamentation or sheer decoration. The special touch of color, finery, or glamour added to a scene or project into a positive rather than negative valuation. Larman is certainly a well-chosen man for the job, as he was proved, or as he has proved in all his subsequent films, such as Moulin Rouge, exclamation point 2001 and the great gatsby 2013 leaving aside for the moment the enigmatic and ineffable quote touch end quote note the direct quotation that castaldi casually made on air mise-en-scene is direction direction is mise-en-scene in a more recent journalistic quip concerning lena 
Dunham's TV series Girls 2012, Australian humorist Helen Razor 2014, waxes even more absolute, quote, nudity becomes mise-en-scene, end quote. Such stark vacillation within media discourses, mise-en-scene is nothing or it is everything, it is echoed all the way up and down the history of film criticism and theoretically informed analysis. So let us return now, not to the theoretical origins of mise-en-scene or its very first and its very first mentions in the global literature on film, but to a particularly significant primal scene of mise-en-scene talk, the 1950s. Style matters. In Europe in the 1950s and in the English-speaking world in the early 1960s, the idea of mise-en-scene was a critical spearhead designed to fight entrenched and parvished casual notations about cinema inherited from other artistic fields, such as theater and literature. André Bazin, 1918-1958, at the head of the Cahiers team in France, and Gussaris, 1928-2012, in film culture, and other U.S. publications, Jose Luis Guaner, 1937-1993, at Film Ideal in Spain, all found themselves faced with the need to combat the idea that a film is essentially its screenplay. The prejudice that this is common sensically where its theme, structure, and meaning reside, and that the work of style in cinema is basically mere technique, simple decoration, quote, information delivery, end quote, or at best an efficient illustration of preset artistry. The battle still rages today in many industrial debates over the director's, quote, possessory credit, end quote, as author of a film. A legal triumph vociferously challenged by many screenwriters. Form as something of a dirty word in those days to many if a director's technique was too evident, too visible, if the ornamentation was too extreme, it was seen as a betrayal of the content, in excess of the duty to tell a story well and clearly, and thus an indulgent formalism. Early attempts by sympathetic cinephile critics to define the elements of mise-en-scene were, to be blunt, pretty vague gestures toward an aesthetic rather than a careful or patient inventory of its component parts. No wonder that in the early 1970s, Brian Henderson labeled mise-en-scene the, quote, grand undefined term, end quote, of film studies. Henderson, 1980, page 49, since he was looking back, for example, to Alexandre Astruc's reflection from 1959, quote, what is mise-en-scene, question mark, end quote, a lyrical piece which answers its titular question only with the broadest and most suggestive formulations, such as, quote, a way of extending states of mind into, into movements of the body, end quote, quote, that mysterious distance between the author and his characters, end quote, or, quote, a particular way of needing to see and to show, end quote, a struck 1985 pages 267 through 268. Much of the same can be said of the formulations in Michelle Marlette's 1959 manifesto, quote, on an ignored art, end quote, written by a today still active expert practitioner of Belle Letters, who eschews close formal analysis in favor of a far from dishonorable vision of criticism based on, quote, awakening in the reader by means of poetic communication, the feeling that a work arouses in us, end quote, Merlette, 1987, page 21. Thus, for Merlette, the attempt to similarly define mise-en-scene calls forth another flurry of fairly abstract terms, elements, and elevated emotional states under the telling subheading, quote, everything is in the mise-en-scene, end quote. Block quote. The curtains open. The house goes dark. A rectangle of light presently vibrates before our eyes. Soon, it is invaded by gestures and sounds. Here, we are absorbed by that unreal space and time, more or less absorbed. The mysterious energy that, or the mysterious energy which sustains with varying felicities the swirl of shadow and light and their foam of sounds is called mise-en-scene. It is on mise-en-scene that our attention is set, organizing a universe, covering the screen, mise-en-scene, and nothing else. Quoted in Hillier, 1985, pages 223 through 224. 
According to Sam Rohde's retrospective account in 2006 of the rise of stylistic criticism in the 1950s, block quote, in general, mise-en-scene denotes a new attitude to the cinema opposed to the literary cinema of the 1930s that turned scripts into images. Mise-en-scene, as used by the Nouvelle Vague critics, referred to a specifically, quote, cinematic, end quote, and natural, realistic rendering of emotion and express expression conveyed less by dialogue and the script than by decor, performance, expression linked to the actor, to his movements and gestures, also to settings and the use of the camera and lighting. Rody, 2006, end of block quote. There are problems with this formulation, such as the assertion that in Nicholas Ray's films, quote, it is what you see and the way you see it, quote, it is what you see and the way you see it, not what is said that is crucial, end quote. But the main point still holds good. Style matters. It is, in fact, crucial and decisive, as well as determining over our experiences as film viewers and critics. The challenge today is not to get caught in the old received traps and biases and, accordingly, to expand our sense of what constitutes style or form in cinema, including its action upon us as spectators. Pure mise-en-scene, question mark. Critics in the 1950s sometimes, no doubt, erred too far in the direction of asserting that a film is not its screenplay or the novel or play from which the screenplay is derived. A cult of pure style was the inevitable outcome of this, and many argumentative convolutions based on spurious assumptions arose to back it up. In 1957, for example, the celebrated Cuban novelist G. Cabrera Infant concluded his review of Tea and, Sym and, Tea and Sympathy, 1956, by Vincent Manelli, a director of whose work he was particularly fond, by citing, quote, two transitions that are poetic instants, end quote, raising themselves far above the theatrical source by Robert Anderson, that is merely, quote, as successful as it is mediocre, end quote. Here, is his description of the first of these instants. Block quote. The woman has attempted futilely to hold back the boy from going to his date with the waitress because she knows that he is going to prove his manliness by destroying love. She appears at the window and looks toward the patio of the school where, through some hedges and trees in the rain, there shines in an inciting and malignant redness the luminous sign of the cafe where the waitress works, the scene dissolves to another rain-streaked window where another woman, the waitress, closes the blind to initiate once more, almost in a mechanical caricature, the act of love which the conventions forbid to the first woman. Cabrera Infant, 1991, page 115, end of block quote. Cabrera Infant con concludes, how accurately, I am not sure, that such moments are, quote, of course, not in the play. They could not have been, not only because they are images of pure cinema, but because they prove that the true poet in, or is named Manelli, end quote. Cabre Cabrera Infant, 1991, page 115. He assumes that his chosen moments are superior to anything in the original stage material, even though he still needs recourse to the scripted plot to evoke their particular poetic pathos, and that implicitly Manelli devised and added and added them. Within the divided film culture scene of Paris in the 1950s, where the editors of Présence du Cinéma, including Marlet Pierre Rissiette and Jacques Lourcelles tended to a, quote, style for style's sake, end quote, position. Some critics within Cahiers du Cinema groped toward a workable combination or interrelation of style and subject. In the late 1990s, the Iranian political diplomat and former Cahiers contributor, Feridon Hoiveda, 1924-2006, through 2006, fondly looked back in his website postings on the polemics of that time, amplifying under the heading, quote, 
what is Mizan Sen, sick question mark, end quote, what he first wrote in a programmatic article of 1960 titled, quote, Sunspots, end quote, block quote, in our Parisian group of the 1950s and 1960s, we deem that the, quote, thought, end quote, of a filmmaker appears through his, quote, mise-en-scene, sick. Indeed, what matters in a film is the desire for order, composition, harmony, the plastic the placing of actors and objects, the choice of setting, the movements within the frame, the capturing of a gesture or a look. In short, the intellectual operation which has put an initial emotion and a general idea to work. Quote, mise-en-scene, end quote, sick is nothing other than the, quote, technique, end quote, invented by each author-director to express the idea and establish the specific quality of his work. Hoy Veda, 1999, see also Hoy Veda, 1986, page 142, end block quote. Jose Luis Guarner, in his no less pra programmatic essay of 1962, quote, Parmenides, end quote, glasses, some reflections on criticism and its practice, end quote, 2013, fought much the same battle against re-argued notions all around him. Influenced by Bazin, Guarner argues that mise-en-scene in Spanish, la pusta en escena, is not mere technique, but a way of regarding or, or a way of regarding of expressing and embodying in attitude toward human beings and their relation to the world. He offers another Vincent Minnelli example, this time from the family melodrama, Home from the Hill, 1960. The scene involves a gruff patriarch, Wade, Robert Mitchum, running verbal rings around Albert Everett Sloan, a local citizen hoping to slyly marry his pregnant daughter off to Wade's son. Theron, George Hamilton, who unbeknownst to both disgustance is actually the child's father, suitably humiliated and sent packing. Albert slinks out the door, down the driveway, and all the way to the large front gate of the Wade residence. The film intercuts his sad journey with the action of Wade, who, unnoticeably by Albert, steps out onto the porch and, in a surprising gesture of civility, turns on the lights at the gate so that Albert is no longer in total darkness. Albert waves his farewell thanks to Wade before exiting and suffering the added humiliation of being noticed by a gossip-prone passerby. Without going as far as Cabrera and Font in claiming that the lights detail, quote, could not have been in the script, Warner nonetheless seizes on the dialogue-less gesture by Wade as the essential element of the scene. Quote, this small action is enough to give an extraordinarily human dignity to the scene, at the same time revealing the director's profound respect for his characters, end quote, Guarner 2013. It is intriguing that Guarner's post-film recall did not retain what is, for me, an even more striking instance in this scene, of what critics in the 1950s and sometimes beyond like to call, quote, pure mise-en-scene, end quote. After, after the lights go on and he has waved goodbye, the shamed Albert disappears for a moment into the pure darkness cast by the shadow of the gate's pillar, a fine example of the type of touch that Cabrera and Font regarded as, quote, poetic instant, end quote. Yet this instant is also one that we could easily connect to larger systematic patterns of meaning in the film involving light and dark, visibility and invisibility, shame and respectability, power and impotence, and so on. This was the type of interpretive mode followed up sometimes only in a sketchy gesture toward the type of full-scale analysis that could be done if only one had the time, means, and opportunity by the movie and positive critics in the 1960s. They went in search of pattern, motifs unfolding, articulated across the entire length of a film. This method 
based more on logical structures than the sometimes purely lyrical effusions of the 1950s critics, has been mocked as the, quote, contrast and compare, end quote, school of critical analysis, analysis faulted for, quote, the kind of mundane and myopic descriptiveness, descriptiveness that has given close analysis such a bad run in the recent, in the recent past, end quote. Verhoeven, 2000, thus, assimil thus assimilating it to the type of dreary, mechanical literary interpretation dutifully taught to young teenagers in dreary classrooms. But the notion of pattern remains an in indispensable tool for any form of film analysis. In landmark 196, or the landmark 1965 book, Hitchcock's Films by Robin Wood, offered for the first time, or for its time, one of the boldest pioneering illustrations of this approach. Wood, quote, revisited, end quote, it for a 1989 edition, again revised in 2002. Critics of this ilk were inexorably moving toward a more holistic appreciation of the interplay between screenwriting and mise-en-scene, especially when research uncovered the fact as it did in relation to Nicholas Ray. For example, thanks to Bernard Eisenschitz's 1993 biography that the director, although uncredited as a writer, particularly in the Hollywood system, often had a crucial role in shaping the shooting script rather before or during production. How is what? By the 1970s, critics and scholars, including V.F. Perkins of Movie and Gerard Legrand of Positif, had arrived at composing their major book-length propositions on cinema aesthetics, distilling and refining the insights gained in the criticism practice month in and month out within their respective magazines and related public forums. Faced with the sharp association between form and content, that most journalists, non-cinephilic commentators, and many filmgoers assumed as common sense reality, and also with the style for style sake excesses of the 1950s and the 1960s. They fought this cultural combat in a new way. Their motto was to use a chapter title from Perkins's lucid 1972 book, Film as Film, Understanding and Judging Movies, How is What? And their mission was to demonstrate it conclusively in critical action. This was also the approach in Australia for or of the influential educationalist John C. Murray, or Murray, author in the 1960s and early 1970s of two valuable pamphlets, 1972-1974, on film and television pedagogy. In, or I discuss aspects of Perkins's well-known book in the next chapter. Here, I would like to emphasize for an overlapping but slightly different perspective, Cinemane, Legrand's remarkable 1979 tome on film aesthetics, long out of print and ignored by virtually all contemporary commentators. Legrand, 1927 through 1999, a remarkable figure, was involved with Positive magazine for 47 years as a monthly contributor and member of its editorial board. He was, as well, a close associate of and collaborator with Andre Breton in the Surrealist Movement, an accomplished poet, an art historian, and a philosopher by profession. He was also, and this is all too rare in the often insular Malay of French intellectual culture, a diligent reader of English language criticism. His book contains several respectful nods toward film as film specifically. For Legrand, as simultaneously in Germany for Frida Graf, cinema's relation to the pictorial arts, especially painting and architecture, are foregrounded in the way he views, grasps, and analyzes a film. His I cannot, his iconological inspiration in this regard derives essentially from the work in art history by Erwin Panofsky, 1983. Strong sequences in film for him are less discrete screens than physical events in which a director seizes a space or place, whether nominally real or wholly invented, 
animates it with action and invests it with intensity and meaning through deploying all the expressive resources of film, resources that he is at pains to enumerate. These located physical events adding up to the total sequence of scenes that comprise a film, then enter into various sorts of poetic correspondence, uncanny similarity, ironic inversion, magical reinvention, parodic recall, and so on. Equally weary of both the, quote, montage cult, end quote, issuing from Sergei Eisenstein, 1893 through 1948, and his epi epigones and of Bazin's overemphasis on the long take, or when Barrett Hodson, 1992, later reformulated as, quote, open image stylistics, end quote, Legrand develops an approach that is at once dialectical and holistic. He broadly agrees with Perkins's view that in narrative cinema, quote, to design an effect involves devising the means to make it credible by locating it within the film's world. The maintenance of credibility acts as a necessary discipline, end quote. Perkins, 1972, pages 96 through 97, but he also emphasizes a more primary level of what could be called the cinematic signifier, a concept I explore further in the following chapter. Although Legrand insists that, quote, the narrative nature of film nowhere enters into direct a priori conflict with its plastic nature, in quote, page 76, his grounding in the visuality of the iconological and iconographic leads him to an intense valuation of this plastic aspect, that is, the, in the first place, purely aesthetic or spectacular attributes of film, which distinguishes him from the central focus on a film's dramatic values characteristic of Perkins, Wood, and many others in their wake. Legrand draws upon a film philosophy source so far unmimed in English language cultures. The Italian philosopher Guido Calagero, who wrote in his 1947 Lezioni de Filosofia, quote, philosophy lessons, end quote, that, block quote, in the cinematograph, the substantial figuration, which is a semantic, utilizes means other than those of literary semanticity. The actor is called upon to exhaust, thanks to the external technique of his living person, the entire asemantic vision of the author. The mass public follows a film like a novel, but the film is an asemantic narrative, a texture of tableau that face front and reflect life. The director works to place in movement and harmonize the figures and gestures of his actors, exactly as a painter works at moving and arranging, according to his whims, the living images of his painting. Quoted in Legrand, 1979, pages 76 through 77, end of block quote. For Legrand, the shot is the crucial unit of film stylistics, with the editing between shots playing a subtle, transitional, non-determining, often purely technical role, where the shot allows that particular unfolding of screen spectacle, which is, for him, the essence of cinema. Note the resonance here with the présence du cinéma, writers who would broadly agree with Legrand's characterization of the filmic medium as a, quote, text without language, end quote, or a, quote, spectacle text, end quote. Obvious editing effects strike him as too external to the represented action, too obviously manipulated of it, and too crude in their stylistic action. Without fetishizing the long take per se, Legrand accords a major stylistic role to the mobile camera's progressive reframings of whatever scene it films. Indeed, for him, it is essentially reframing that articulates connections between elements and creates the possibility of comparing different pictorial arrangements or compositions, thus creating multiple images or, quote, shots, end quote, loosely defined within a single shot. Legrand is concerned to establish a workable approach to analyzing style in cinema, 
and a cat categorization of the basic different styles, which he nominates as closed, open, and composite. His angle of attack here is unusual and dis disarming. Unlike so many analysts past and, and present, unlike so many analysts past and present, he does not proceed in the first place via a counting or breakdown of shots and angles. Rather, he attempts to seize the simultaneous interplay of three decisive levels. These are the multiple rhythms of a film, multiple because they are formed from the simultaneous interaction of shot duration, the rhythm of the dramatic action, and the, quote, more or less discontinuous rhythm of exchanges of looks, gestures, relations of the actor with the objects around him, end quote. The pictorial framings and their content and vastly the surface elements that include, for him, the actor's performance in their, quote, photogenic, end quote, quality. The visual aspects of the, cine the, visual aspects of the cinematography and the film's range of colors in which he includes the shadings of black and white. The most detailed example of stylistic analysis offered in Cinemani, or Cinemani concerns a sequence from a film today little known outside Italy and possibly not very much inside it either. Luigi Comencini's Infanzia Vocazione a Prime Esperance de Giacoma, Giacoma Casanova Veneziano, a.k.a. Casanova, His Youthful Years, 1969. Legrand describes a scene in which young Casanova, Leonard Whiting, plays a violin serenade flanked by adoring women at his feet. After the breakdown of this initial tableau into closer detail shots and, quote, admirable camera movement, end quote, ascends to frame in the distance the character of Angela, Christina Copensini, behind a window also singing. The camera descends, and a cut takes us to another angle on Casanova. His body tends to the left, where Angela is situated off screen, while the other women's bodies tend to the right, thus, quote, separating, end quote, him from the object of his desire. Night falls as the music, and the scene ends. Quote, the meaning of the scene, end quote, suggests Legrand, quote, is multiple without recourse to any symbol foreign to the film, end quote. A position very similar to film as film's instant, or film as film's insistence, quote, credibility, end quote, as necessary artistic discipline. The Casanova scene is, block quote, at once, quote, moral, end quote, social, the hero, quote, rises, end quote, towards the chateau summit, but must choose between a romantic singer and the far more appetizing, quote, cousins, end quote, who are at his feet, and ontological, the, quote, flight of time, end quote, banishes the moment of dream and uncertain pleasures, but art, the, quote, success of a life, end quote, according to the historical Casanova, the, quote, portrait of an era, end quote, according to Comencini, sublimates it and fixes its contribution or its contradictions. Legrand, 1979, page 90 through 91. End of block quote. Legrand also notes the pattern of echoes that springs from the scene. The situation of Casanova, quote, between two women, end quote, will be replayed in the film's, quote, final parodic ballet, end quote, and inverted in terms of gender in the depiction of his mother, quote, between two libertines, end quote, page 91. Here, we can see at work the fused, fused approach that Lebron takes to the interweavings and interconnections that comprise his chosen scene. He opposes the isolating of formal elements or the defining of coded, quote, minimal units, end quote, associated with linguistics-based semiotic analysis of cinema, against which his book wages a sustained polemic. Rather, as he asserts, quote, neither objects in the decor nor the actors, end quote, gestures are, quote, minimal, end quote, and indivisible unities on screen. They are not even always, quote, isolatable, end quote, unities. End of quote. Legrand, 1979, page 87. In relation to Comencini's Casanova, Legrand evokes in words 
an unfolding swirl of expressive movements of variously the camera, the bodies, and the music, and the, quote, unpacking, end quote, of the initial tableau with its bodily postures, a pictorial and theatrical arrangement, at first static and then gradually animated within the carefully arranged architectural, architectural space in order to arrive at a cluster of meanings involving fix, fixity and flight, art and life, desire and romance, as he asserts good films marked as for Perkins by a high degree of, quote, internal coherence, end quote, managed to travel almost miraculously from a from an initial asemantic magma of material and sensory elements to a specifically wrought, quote, quote, philosophy, quote, end of quote, of space and its contents, a philosophy not reducible to an ideology, end of quote. Cinemani, 1979, page 94. This approach is taken up with even greater rigor by Legrand's colleague at Positif, Alain Maison, in his critical practice and his 1994 book, Les Recites au Cinema, or Au Cinema, Les Recites au Cinema, where or where does mise en scène enter as a term into Lagrange's system? Question mark. Where Perkins's book pointedly avoids giving it a primary role, he uses a wider and more specific range of plain language functions such as camera viewpoint, gesture, and so on. Cinemani proposes its own eccentric typographical rendering of mise en scène as mise en scène, at least for the first few pages that the or that he estimates his readers can bear it. This is in order to indicate the more inclusive range of functions that his term carries in comparison with mise-en-scene as traditionally wielded in film criticism. For Legrand, mise-en-scene, I, too, shall now drop the capitalization and dashes, is an activity which is, quote, receivable by the spectator and blessed, blessed with diverse, quote, powers, end quote, end of quote. It can appear only via a, quote, network of mechanisms, end quote, and unities of visual sonorous reception. Legrand, 1979, page 22. Thus, mise-en-scene comes to function in Cinemani as a stand-in for the multifaceted creature, which is film style itself, but in a particular restricted definition, which Legrand views as inappropriate to the cinematic medium, namely style as spectacle, style as display. This is very different from some of the more mystified trends in the or in 1960s criticism, such as Andrew Sars's appeal to an enigmatic, quote, interior meaning, end quote, in a director's work, the, quote, ultimate glory of the cinema as an art, end quote. It is, quote, extrapolated from the tension between a director's personality and his material, end quote, 1963, or Jean Duchette's insistence on the spookily, quote, occult, end quote, hidden dimension of a cherished, cherished artur, such as Alfred Hitchcock, Duchette, 19, or Duchette, 2003, Legrand, could well have adopted Perkins's formulation of 1999, or Le Legrand could well have adopted Perkins's formulation of 1990 that meanings in cinema are not hidden, rather they are staged and filmed, shown and unfolded for us. If we are able to intuit the, quote, structure of understandings, end quote, that the film has built. In the strict sense, from the very start of the campaign on behalf of detailed appreciative film criticism, we can detect this inexorable sliding from a specific term, mise-en-scene, to the larger matter of film style, and then further still, until it encompasses something as grand as film creation or cinematic artistry itself. This is a mixed blessing, good because it has inspired a lot of passionate work and offered some tools albeit fragmentary and partial, for carrying it out. Bad, because it creates confusions and blockages. Look back at Hoyveda's list. 
It leaps from very particular material tropes, such as, quote, the placing of actors and objects, end quote, all the way to the, to, quote, the idea, end quote, and the quality of a director's work. This confusion was inevitable in 1960 because much was at stake in cultural terms, not only the correct, the correct valuing of the contribution of film directors, but also rescuing from also instant oblivion many of the actual films they made or they had made, especially if in little respected popular genres such as the costume and or costume adventure film, Fritz Lang, Jacques Tournoir and Max Ophels all went there, the Western, the gangster movie, or the musical comedy. Many subsequent deployments of the term, however, including some I have already surveyed in this chapter, will be haunted by this historic ambiguity. On the one hand, the term seems to mean a little mystically everything, cinema as an expressive art form becoming syn synonymous with mise-en-scene. On the other hand, as Rhodey, so casually remarked in his 2006 survey, quote, mise-en-scene is nothing very specific, end quote. Many attempts have, however, been made to specify it, and these, too, present problems. On the one hand, strict definitions spring from a laudably rational, empirical, scientific turn of mind. I do believe that we need to be able, in certain circumstances, to constrain or specify what we take mise-en-scene to mean, or cover in reference to all the operations and levels at play in the construction of a film. Editing, for instance, enters into many significant relations with mise-en-scene, a frequently overlooked notion, which I will be at pains to stress later, but is not reducible to it. On the other hand, and inevitably, rationally circumscribed definitions tend to brutally amputate the naive, once upon a time excitement, which comes with claiming that mise-en-scene is some magic key to the intricacies of film style. Let us cite a classroom favorite, the, stru the strict definition of mise-en-scene from an early edition of David Portwell and Kristen Thompson's well-known textbook, Film Art in Introduction, which refers back to the stage origin of the term. Block quote. In the original French, the term means, quote, having been put into the scene, end quote, and it was first applied to the practice of stage direction. Film scholars extending the term to film direction as well use the term to signify the director's control over what appears in the film frame. As you would expect from the term's theatrical origins, mise-en-scene includes those aspects that overlap with the art of the theater, setting, lighting, costume, and the behavior of the figures. In controlling the mise-en-scene, the director stages the event for the camera. Wordwell and Thompson, 1979, page 75, in the block quote. Thus, for Wordwell and Thompson, mise-en-scene denotes a specific ensemble of for formal elements and definitely does not include the, quote, cutting or the camera movements, the dissolves or off-screen sound, end quote, of, film, uh, of a film, page 75. This formulation is more ambiguous and slippery than it might at first appear. Mise-en-scene is staged for the camera, but does not itself include the work of the camera, beyond the rather static notion of pictorial composition. But at the least, but at least in fictional cinema, there is never, or very rarely, a discrete, purely theatrical level in the actual practice of filmmaking. Everything that is designed, staged, lit, dressed, and so forth is done with a particular vantage point, a particular angle, or rather a con concatenation of various perspectives and angles in mind. It is common practice, for example, for only so much of a set to be built as will be included within the camera's purview. In a sense, Bordwell and Thompson are using a methodological couplet I will explore later. Etienne Surya's distinction, 1953, between the profilmic and the filmic, but in a way that is not truly just or entirely helpful to stylistic analysis. 
staging, a term that bore well foregrounds in his later work, 1997 and 2005, A, is one I will also use. It, too, has a theatrical ring, but when Bordwell speaks, for example, of staging in depth, he is referring to the combined action of the perspective taken by the camera and often designed into the set and the actions, figures, and objects arranged before it. If we ever need a decent English translation of mise-en-scene, staging is not bad. At the, at the very least, it focuses an important element of the concept that I want to preserve throughout the argument of this book. Mise-en-scene is indeed the art of arranging, choreographing, and displaying. And an essential part of this, in many films of many different kinds, happens in what is staged predominantly actors in an environment for a camera. The time-space continuum. To take a contemporary use of the term which responds to a quite different, quote, pioneering, end quote, spirit, rather than to sober, rather, rather than to the sober need for a limited def definition, we can turn to John Gribb's invaluable 2002 book, Mise-en-Scene, Film Style and Interpretation, although I already have a problem with the immediate coupling of style with interpretation, exclamation point. In his text, Gibbs enthusiastically endorses the widest possible definition and applied or er, and application of the term as first suggested in a breathless 1961 text by Robin Wood. Block quote. A director is about to make a film. He has before him a script, camera, lights, decor, actors. What he does with them is mise-en-scene. And it is precisely here that the artistic significance of the film, if any, lies. The director's business is to get the actors, with their cooperation and advice, to move, speak, gesture, register expressions in a certain manner, with certain inflections, at a certain tempo. It is his business to place the actor significantly within the decor, so that the decor itself becomes an actor, with the advice and cooperation of the cameraman to compose and frame the shots, regulate the tempo and rhythm of movement within the frame and the movement of the camera to determine the lighting of the scene. In all this directors or in all this the director's decision is final. All this is mise en scene. The movement of the film from shot to shot, the relation of one shot to all the other shots already taken or not which will make up the finished film, cutting, montage, all this is mise-en-scene. It is also what fuses all these into one organic unity, the tone and atmosphere of the film, visual metaphor, the establishment of relationships between characters, the relation of all parts to the whole. All this is mise-en-scene. One can sum up by defining mise-en-scene with Danielle Valcruz, quite simply as, quote, the organization of time and space, end quote, quoted in Gibbs 2002, pages 56 through 57, end of block quote. Somewhere between the strict Ortwell and Thompson and the loose wood, we find today various positions on Misansen that equate it, as LeBron does, with some specific aspect of aesthetic style or a particular bundle of stylistic components and operations. Thus, Barrett Hodgson's move from a, quote, basic definition, end quote, quote, the staging of action before the camera in a fictive context, end quote, to a, quote, more elaborate working definition, end quote, which is, quote, the precise placement of actors and objects before the camera in various spatial, pictorial, and rhythmic combinations, end quote, Hodgson, 1992, page 74, or Thomas L. Saucer's useful shorthand, mise-en-scene equals, quote, visual rhetoric, end quote, L. Saucer, 1981, page 10, a concept that has the virtue of evoking the ways in which not only each image is arranged, staged, expressively, which tends to be the focus of much mise-en-scene criticism, but also how diverse images are arranged in relation to each other, thus bringing in editing, overall treatments of the image, such as color grading, sapia, saturation, etc., 
and the large area of special effects, both in the digital and pre-digital eras. All that authorism allows. Bound up in the historic description or inflation of mise-en-scene as the height, indeed the very definition, of film style is a special kind of myth or what Hodgson calls a mystique, which has become an acute part of, cine of cinephile culture. In this myth, mise-en-scene is more than merely a special touch or magic ingredient stirred into the soup. Rather, it comes to designate a particular moment or stage in filmmaking, which is the highest quintessential moment of cinematic creation. Wood expresses the drama of this decisive moment in a nutshell. Quote, he has before him a script, camera, lights, decor, actors, end quote. There is a kind of primal scene in play here, the auteur re weaving his or her mise-en-scene right on the spot, on the set, during filming. This is a theory of production in the, in the industrial sense, not pre-production planning or post-production treatments, but what is known as principal photography or, more colloquially, quote, the shot, end quote. It privileges what the director captures on film, the staged pro-filmic, and how the camera frames and apprehends it. Even a commentator such as Hodgson momentarily betrays this reductive, fantasizing tendency when he speaks lovingly of, quote, the mobile camera that could almost imperceptibly shift a narrative from a prosaic to a poetic mode. Max Ophuls, Orson Welles, Vincent Minnelli, or Vincent Minnelli, Samuel Fuller, end quote. Hodgson, 1992, page 81. Of course, the moment of shooting, the production phase, is important, but only, I will argue, as important as every other level and stage in the art and craft of film direction. If we seek a holistic and authentic appreciation of film style, we need to give up the myth of divinely inspired direction on the set, conjuring movie magic in the inspired camera movement, a, ca a clever rearrangement of decor, the tweaking of a lighting pattern, or the welcoming of a spontaneous gesture from an actor. Not completely, of course, movie lore is full of tales which convince us that this type of inspired moment of creation does indeed happen, and perhaps often, although not always solely because of the director! Exclamation point. But we need to have done with the dream that, quote, creation on set, end quote, is the only or primary site where a film is made or where, where it becomes art. Why did we ever fall for this myth? Question mark. Autourism deserves some of the blame, not for its essential, irrefutable premise that the director, while rarely working or inventing alone, is nonetheless the central organizing point of the creative process, the one who can implement a coherent, systematic vision, but for some of the baggage that historically has become attached to it. Since the notion of mise-en-scene arose, in no small part from the attempt in the 1950s to artistically valorize Hollywood products of the studio era. The director was usually pictured as someone surrounded by constraints and in interventions, particularly at the pre- and postmodern stages. The script was preset. The actors were already cast. The contract set designers and costumiers were willed in to provide their usual contributions. The editing was often out of the director's hands. There is no doubt some reality of this picture, after all, in auteurs such as Joseph von Sternberg delighted in boasting. However, disingenuously, that he came onto the set in order to weave arabesque of light and shadow around whatever awful script to which he had been assigned, Sternberg, 1988. Critics were, however, a little too eager to accept this scenario as the basis for their an analytical practice. Even the sophisticated attempt by Peter Wolin in the late 1960s to redefine auteurism in a hopefully scientific manner fell prey to the myth. 
for him, a director's, quote, core thematic, end quote, is to be deciphered by the critical mind, quote, screening out the noise, end quote, in an information system sense. Added by the studio system, genre collaborators, screenplay convictions, and so on. Wolin, 2013. It is little wonder, then, that in this fanciful imagining of what it is that a director does and how he or she communicates via the medium of film, the moment of shooting would become the decisive moment of creation. Because logically, it can be construed, and, and this, too, is something of a fantasy as the virginal, untouchable stage of that process. Yet the powers and resources of expressivity in any art form cannot be reduced to a soul stage or moment when a set of given materials is, quote, transcended, end quote, a truly romantic notion. Apart from its role in one cultural war or another, mise-en-scene as a bandied about term in the 1950s and 1960s was also linked to a particular kind of experience, cinephile experience. Hodgson relates it to, quote, critical euphoria, end quote, the delight in discovering films and sharing their most dazzling virtuosic, virtuosic moments and an era of, quote, phenomenological criticism, end quote, coarse or otherwise, before the rise of a more systematic, rigorous, hard-lined theoretical approach of the 1970s. Yes, he admits the term was vague, but precisely because of that, intoxicating, it allowed cinephiles to gesture to something that set their cinema experience apart from, on the one hand, quote, the obvious and basic trademarks of filmic storytelling that normally ensnarled the public, end quote, and on the other, the encroachment of television, which on a daily basis cheapened the resources of visual rhetoric in its programs and indeed in its broadcast schedules. Brutally, quote, assimilated, downgraded, and fractured, end quote, the movies of the past, Hodgson, 1992, page 73. No wonder there was a lust in the air for a little transcendence, as well as a particular type of charged nostalgia. In the mood, in recent years, some scholars and critics have revived the concept of mise-en-scene in the context of a general engagement with affect, the spectator's emotional states triggered by a film, over and above the literary or dramatic niceties of thematic meaning. This has had important consequences for the current conceptualization of form and its action in cinema. The Australian scholar Anne Rutherford, for instance, eschews us of the word style because of its connotation in many minds of something extraneous or merely decorative, while proposing mise-en-scene to be usefully synonymous with, quote, energetic process, that organic unity, that elusive quality of flow and energy that moves a film and moves us as spectators with it, end quote. Rutherford, 2012, page 305. See also Rutherford, 2011. This, at first glance, seems not too far removed from Marlette or Astruc's Rhapsody circa 1959, but the definition comes into its own when Rutherford analyzes in films by Wong Kar Wai, Quentin Tarantino, Lee Myung Se, and others, quote, the setting in motion of spatiotemporal relationships, end quote. Rutherford, 2012, page 302. In this account, the dynamism of movement and the often highly artificial means that cinema uses to incite emotion become more crucial to a theory of film than notions of the photographic index, that, quote, piece of reality, end quote, caught by a camera, here, cinema, while never entirely giving up its indexical connection to flesh and blood elements, such as actors move closer to animation and to abstraction. 
What we might today call an energetic or dynamic approach to film style has its roots in the type of theoretical approaches to cinema that came to prominence during the 1970s. Jean-Francois Leotard, 1978, Stephen Heath, 1981, and Claudine I. Zeichmann, 1976, all gestured to this type of understanding, using Freudian and post-Freudian psychoanalysis as their model for introducing the action of psychic drives of psychic drives into psychic drives into both the making of films and their reception. Within a quite different critical tradition, Raymond Dirknet, 1932 through 2002, also insisted on a complex dynamic A, comp a complex dynamic model of film structure. Quote, structure must be functional. It exists to a or to transfer loads and stresses, stresses in exactly the same way as an engineering structure exists to diffuse or to concentrate or to reorganize pressures which are exerted at particular points. End quote. Dirknet, 1974, page 262. For some filmmakers, particularly those of a reflective bent, would agree to this. For Chilean-born Raul Ruiz, the Sigmund Freud outlined what Sigmund Freud outlined as the mechanics of the dream work, the condensations, displacements, and overdeterminations that create what we see, hear, and feel in our dreams are the very operations of mise-en-scene itself. In a striking formulation, Ruiz called these Freudian mechanisms, quote, the mise-en-scene of the dream, end quote. Hence, transposing this concept directly to cinema, all mise-en-scene, no matter whether it is working on the most obviously dreamlike or the most seemingly naturalistic material, has the function of, quote, producing displacements of intensity. And condensations, end quote, Ruiz, 1999, page 84. It warps and stresses the scene, twisting it potentially into a strange shape or an unforeseen direction. For my part, at the, outside, out, at the outset of this book, I want to hold on to Ruiz's sense of mise-en-scene as always potentially transformative, but transformative in ways that refer to the entire materiality of cinema, not solely the inspiration of a direction, or of a director on set, or the phenomenological subjectivity of enraptured viewers. The transformation is not transcendence. Mise-en-scene can transform the elements of a given scene. It can transform a narrative's destination. It can transform our mood or our understanding as we experience the film. Style is not a supplement to content. It makes content and remakes it, too, in flight. Rutherford is at least partly right when she when she suggests that mise-en-scene quote is the only concept we have in quote rutherford 2012 page 305 that can help us capture this very material practice of magic by the end of this book i hope to have added a few more concepts and i was reading chapter one Chapter one, a term that means everything and nothing specific. Chapter one, a term that means everything and nothing specific in mise-en-scene and film style from classical Hollywood to new media art by Adrian Martin.